failure mode. They were just operating and moving air. That's what they were doing. Uh, the variable air volume dampers, controls, and thermostat inside the building had been disconnected. Of course, no longer functioning. Uh, could not perform at all. Systems were never designed to maintain acceptable humidity levels, relative humidity levels, which is very important, especially on, on, in Baldwin County, Alabama. Uh, they just, part of the system wasn't designed. It wasn't, wasn't required by then, it wasn't designed at that time. Found the interior ductwork and put variations of the residential style ductboard and, and flexible duct. It, it, just made to, it just made to work. They were just trying to keep it going and keep it work by the maintenance staff and the service people. The equipment had, out, had outlived its usual service life and needed to be replaced. And that was our recommendation on going forward with that. These are some conditions that we found that just in gut work, now all your air is moving, you know, air is moving through this, this, this duct. They would see here it's leaking, you got rust, and uh, it, it degrades to a, to a great deal of extent. So you see the humidity, the condensation forming on the bottom side of the unit, just not in control situation at all. Uh, the, the duct work. Up above the sleeve of what's left of it. These have been up in a real hot environment. Uh, these are residential kind of uh, ducts that we're seeing above the sleeve line, and uh, that's, that's some of the things that we have with them. Bottom side of the unit, you see the de degradation going on on the pan of the units, and just work. These units are just, they're just out of there. Now. They just, they, they're gone. Uh, the next thing we looked at the metal roof systems and, and the flashing, uh, the metal roof panels and trim, uh, include the roof problems and the decking. Uh, the roof insulation, uh, the gutters and downspouts, subsurface drainage, and the metal coping and flashing, that's all the things we looked at with regard to this, uh, this part of the building. We found that the roof, uh, the roof systems, uh, it, the thermal movement on the panel were not uh, accommodated for. Uh, they were not controlled. And uh, thus we had um, one of the problems they had with, with multiple points of panel, roof panels in the pixel, which, which leads to distortion, deformation of the roof panel, opening up seams, and so on and so forth. We found a lack of diaphragm in the roof support structure. Uh, the panels, uh, the, the purlins on the roof get rolled. And, uh, so they were taken off during some repair work that was made or re-roofing at some uh, point in time. And a lack, so lack of diaphragm, very important diaphragm issue that we need to have. Uh, loose and missing structural bracing, we found that as we were looking through up in the ceilings in our report. Uh, Fabric and fact out resulting in holes in the roof panel, unsealed critical flashing uh, transition and interface conditions. All the ruptures in the metal roof panels. In several locations, water intrusion to the building. And uh, these are some of the things we've seen. We've seen that the roof, these panels have joints and they have the panels are pitched down and that we have factor backed out in all these locations. Naturally, every time the factor backed out, we got water in the building. That's what people have. This is a close up view of what's going on. You see the factor back. They should be down tight. Uh, joining that's just wrong. Uh, all that leaks from the fact that we got the roof. Leave it on the photograph, that hole goes right into, right into the uh, wall sand. So you have cracks in the ethos and are stuck on this particular day. Uh, degradation, so you just age does this. Uh, you just got holes in the roof, water getting in here. So it's, 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 it's some isolated area, just an example of what we're seeing. Uh, exterior finishes, wall and ceiling finishes we looked at. Uh, the, uh, it's all exterior. Uh, the, uh, the window, storefront doors, and the joint ceiling. Uh, we looked at all of those. Found that the exterior walls here is you know, extensive amounts of damage, and uh, as a result of damages occurring, uh, water intrusion occurring, uh, affecting the substrate board and, and on into the interior, so the interior of the building. Uh, wall finish uh, does not have an adequate clearance of gray. Uh, it's too, too close to the ground. Uh, landscaping efforts over the last past 20 years, 28 years, the, the, the ground have, have risen up, not in control, so that's one thing that's caused the problem. Uh, and, uh, a wall. Wall surface, uh, I mean, wall and slab interface, you know, not adequate seal. When that starts getting wet, and water starts getting in these areas, starts moving, deformation occurs, and naturally we don't get water. Water and moisture and air and everything else in this building, these locations. Uh, storefront, so we'll just follow that, required seal flash. You know, the final thing you can see. Uh, they need to be there to have to flash this water that gets into these assemblies and gets it out. Um, uh, not watertight under you know, severe storm conditions. Uh, they get plenty of storms and rain down. Uh, interior water damage below the windows and uh, the exterior wall. This goes back to the, uh, the wall grade being too high and not being sealed. And ceilings are in degraded condition uh, throughout. This is an example of what we're seeing. We're seeing water coming off the roof that's not being controlled. It's causing all this. 
ground in the bottom of the roof panel in phase and actually taken on water. And you'll see the results of some of this that we have that we have uh, you know that we found in on the interior walls going beyond that. Same situation here, this happens to be a duck area, but there's no transition made here for to accommodate any water to get out of this wall so it's sort of sucked it's sucked it into a deep in the building. Same situation, you know, this is a one that does have some gutter control, but still the water comes sheeting down the exterior of the wall just getting in the accent bands and getting getting in the wall assembly at that point. Uh, here's an example of a storefront system where you've got the grade and the, and the slab at the same elevation. Well, naturally, if we get a little buildup of water, we're going to take water right in under this, under this condition. It's you know, not bad for a perfect form there. Here's another condition. It's uh, where, where the grade is up and the wall is too close to the bottom. These are just like they just look at that. This, this elevation we, where we got you know, we couldn't see what's growing there. And that's not a pretty silent built, but uh, that's an example of what we're going to see in this situation. Typical joint, crack condition, see what's going, uh, some accident bands are uh, taking on water. All these leads are what we're seeing on the interior conditions that we found. Naturally, uh, we've got, you know, crack that's blown up in here after a storm. We've got, uh, you know, the here, here we got pretty good clearance between the, the, the slab edge and the, and the bottom of the wall. The gray is pretty good. But we got potable water out here. And that's not good for, uh, for any, any kind of a water sheet going away from this building, not, not collecting around the, the base of it the most. So kind of things we're looking at to look at. Interior finishes we've seen to be a, a be problematic. Uh, and if you look at the you know, closed drywall finishes, the cushion tile and grid, the carpet and base, the vinyl composite tile and base. Uh, case work finishes the hardware, all the metal doors and frames, and uh, hardware we have there. Uh, we found that Interior drywall damage from, in, from water intrusion and high humidity levels. Uh, vinyl base loose from water from water intrusion and high humidity levels. The glue is just not collecting stick, it's just too much too much work to go on. Stained carpet from water intrusion. Interior aluminum wind frames uh, show evidence of uh, water leakage <coughs> and interior condensation <coughs> that we think about. Acoustical ceiling grid, rust corrosion, and ceiling uh, tile sank from high humidity level and the way that this duct work is laid on top of it seen in earlier slides. And the evidence of biological growth uh, that, that we didn't notice. Here's an interior condition that we found above the ceiling. Um, this, is a, this is the exterior of the stud wall of the exterior of the building. Here's the main frame. Of course, the stud walls are not totally structural. They're just more of a veneer, but it's a metal frame building. Uh, the, you see the studs are in pretty good condition. You can see here, you see what's happening to our sheeting behind the call the water intrusion from, from along this level here. Top of the ceiling, looking at displacement of insulation and the weight of it, and the tile just displaced from, from the money. Uh, trying to work on the ductwork, trying to work on the, uh, the IT systems and all that, just, just out of control. Of that. Uh, you see the carpet, you see that in the photograph, that the water stains in the carpet just threw out on the exterior wall and the location of the ground. Cracks, you know, but the base coming off, this is at the corner of a, a building, or one of the classrooms here, you see the base coming loose. It's just not sticking. Probably more sure high humidity the level that we have there. Of course, we've got cracks in the joints of the wall. But you're not seeing a lot of degradation along the exterior walls along the base, separate the fences. Fences were our concern. We don't think we're going to have a great deal of interior, uh, uh, exterior stud walls to replace. Now, there may be some isolated, but we don't think that's a major issue here. This is an example throughout that you see with the corner bead on the drywall. <coughs> this would have to be at the window, the window jam uh, because of the condensation levels there and the moisture bombs that rust. So this is uh, some paint filling up off one of the columns, and you see the, the condition of the sheetrock underneath it, and it gets worse. You pull up the vinyl covered wall, uh, the wall covering, and that's what you find in the wall location. So it's, um, it's a major, major, major concern. This is the one of the condensation that the windows fell, the curtain wall fell. You see the, the, the old in here, you see the water stain has been in here inside the building. Resolutions. Recommended in our initial report back in June, uh, in, uh, June 15 uh, that under the HVAC systems, uh, that a new HVAC system be engineered and installed to serve the facility. We just introduced a new functional variable air volume. We direct expansion AC system with modulated control instead of being on the control uh, or modulated the control of this. Uh, variable air volume terminal uh, with great heat to address the temperature and humidity. Very, very important in this climate. And there's control, the reading needs to do 
through the review process uh, for the compensation that's going to be in this building. And on the roof system, um, the boats to replace the metal roof system, flashing the trim, some new rigid insulation on the deck, get it off the ceiling, put it on the deck so it's captured forevermore, just there from now on. So you wouldn't be dealt with with the cat five wiring or whatever you got to do above the ceiling. <laughs> Downspout to the roof frame, control the water as it falls off the building, and then add some sort of drainage system to carry the water away from the building. Water's going to happen. And we'll grab it, get it off the, get it off the spot. That's what our goal is. Exterior finishes, replace all storefront framing and glass, replace exterior wall finishes, replace all joint sills. Interior finishes, replace damage or deteriorate system drywall, stop new wall insulation. Replace all vinyl wall coverings and skin to finish with the ceiling paint. Uh, uh, paint all gypsum drywall, prime cap, prime, uh, trip line, prime and paint all the interior curtains, metal door frames, and all other uh, metal, uh, like gas and stuff like that inside the building. Uh, even fire alarms, that's up there, fire extinguishers, cabinets are rusty uh, inside of all of those. Not just located to the outside wall, it's throughout the entire. Replace all carpet and, and vinyl base. Uh, replace all vinyl and vinyl tile and base. Place is finished saving tile and grid. This is, this is what we propose, of course, is the, the process. And, and we, this comes with a lot of uh, you know, interaction with partners and trying to uh, the best the best plan to approach uh, the construction or how we're going to remodel, how we're going to renovate, and, and handle the students, the student loads, the lab work is done in these facilities. So uh, after talking to all the uh, deans and uh, Department heads, uh, chairpersons, and people in charge of their facilities and, and students. And we feel like this is the best solution to it. And create a temporary, a temporary classroom facility out here. Uh, couple that with relocating students and programs during the duration of construction to minimize the activity in this area, and, uh, uh, and then give this to the contractor at one point to renovate these two buildings. Forward with that, once that's renovated and everything with all the students and the program that we put back into the building, and this will be this will go away. Uh, uh, this is a change, proposed change to try to pick up some design elements in the newer, the newer building on campus in Warren Hall. It's using asphalt shingles instead of, instead of the uh, metal panels, it's using brick instead of the EPAS or uh, stucco, it's using some accent stone just, just to catch those design elements. That's just all that's going Try to, try to update it to make it look like an ongoing part of the campus and it's growing in that direction down as far as that part of the campus. This is what the building looks like presently. That's what we propose it to look like as our renovation going forward with that. The Advanced Technology Center is what it looks like presently, the same thing there. And because of the geometry here involved and the angles involved, we'll have to maintain the metal roof on this corner. Uh, there's just not practical to put shingles on that the greatest uh, construction. So we'll have to do it there. But it'll be a new roof panel. It won't be a short laps in and expose back so that has to change. We propose a connecting cord between the two that we talked about right now. This does not exist in these buildings, it's just separated by, by, by the sidewalk. So we propose just connecting the two buildings and, and blend them together. So traffic can flow from one to the other and we can get that somewhat protected. In the whole process, uh, you know, we, we look at try to relocate the, the IT department, put in another building, move two or three times, move them around campus and this is what we come up with was uh, proposed for a new IT building, a small building, some part of the campus, uh, just out uh, be a new construction building. And uh, we come up with the design scheme of looking at, at what it will look like, uh, based on the same brick, the, the, the shingles, and accent stones, and nothing fancy here. Uh, it's somewhat not a hard facility, it will be all concrete, but there'll be precautions made because this building is an IT building, and we are in a tropical area uh, for storms semi-hard, we call it semi-hard construction. You know, we'll have some sealed CMU blocks and things like that, not just a metal frame like a metal building with a metal roof on it. That's all you got there where they are now. So that'd be a big improvement here. So we looked at all that and basically the floor plan uh, will, will be uh, like this. And this has been worked closely with uh, between Kevin and Dennis and the uh, Brian IT director uh, on the fall. This is the last scheme that they come up with for the floor plan. It's not a big building, it's a small building. But it does serve their purpose and it's a standalone building for them in a semi hard, semi hard environment. Uh, be closer to the administration building, uh, and like I said, more central. Mm -hmm. 
cost estimates, these cost estimates are withholding through the cost estimates that we looked at for base cost innovation uh, for the career technology for uh, 1.1,885,000,
I do not at this time. have certain things. We have to have a air and moisture barrier on the outside of that wall. 
we have to have a roof that doesn't leak, you know, that, that accommodates the heat that's built up in that area down there in Baldwin County. Because we know the metal panel, we know the construction going to move, you have to accommodate that kind of thing. So, yeah, so there have been some, they, 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 technology's changed. So all three things we talked about, sir, is exactly dead on what, what had happened. And you're, you're comfortable, based on what you're proposing, the issues we're struggling with right now will pretty much go away. Yes. That and coupled with it. Some good commitment on maintenance going forward. That that go, they go hand in hand. We have to have that commitment from the college on a local level to make put a system in that they number one they understand, and number two they can work on. Because it does nobody any good to put a system in and then nobody can work on. Next thing you know, they're out here pulling plugs on the control system and the management system. That does nobody any good. Pay a lot of money for something you're never going to use. We got involved with this in, in, in Mississippi with, with, with Governor Parker on some of the buildings over there. We were putting computerized systems, control systems, in an Alcorn State University over there, which is a great university. The guys didn't know how to operate. That, that's that's a fallacy. We have we have to be more hand in hand with today's construction and tomorrow's maintenance. And that's something that we will work hard with Mr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Franks going forward, making sure this is maintained and looked at and, you know, within the areas that we can. That's what has to be done. Any other questions, comments from the trustees? Mr. Moore, thank you for that good presentation. Very so thorough, very clear. Um, Chancellor, I'd like to if, if this is if this presentation has been handed, is uh, I think it's a little more extensive than what was emailed to us. If it is, uh, you can make sure they get a copy of the mail to the right to it. Or you can take it. Okay, yeah, uh, Crystal. Do you have anything else? No, I don't. I'm just I'm also thankful for the presentation. Uh, in my business, I've, I've worked alongside uh, Mr. Ward very many times in North Alabama and respect his work and appreciate the efforts made here. Yeah. 
two other grants are the Teachers Education Assistance for College and Higher Education grants, more commonly known as TEACH grants. Um, there are some restrictions on this grant, such as you have to major and teach in a high needs field. STEM, um, special education, I think, is one. Um, and if you and teach in a certain school, if you don't follow that, this grant will turn into a loan. So there are some stipulations on that. But that annual maximum is $4,000. And the Iraq and Afghanistan service grant, um, that was created after 9-11, and it is for students who have lost a parent after 9-11 in either um, Iraq or Afghanistan. And um, that funding varies year by year. Right now, currently, a student can be awarded up to $5,382.30 as long as they're awarded October 1 of 15 and before October 1 of 16. <laughs> Some more financial aid um, awards or more common ones are your federal work study program. Um, and this program is a need based program that allows students to earn money to help pay for college. It offers campus based or community based employment opportunities and the students earn federal minimum wage. Um, this program will allow students part-time, so no more than 20 hours a week. Um, and they actually get this funding as a paycheck. This funding is not paid to them in one lump sum. They earn this money as they go. They get paid every two weeks, and it is actually through your HR department at the institution. They get a paycheck. Um, federal subsidized student loans. Um, this is also need-based, and um, a student can be awarded up to $5,500 grade level and dependency status, whether they're a dependent or independent student, um, that number can vary. And this um, loan, the government pays the interest while the student's enrolled in school. So this, the student is not responsible for any interest this loan is occurring while in school. Um, federal unsubsidized student loans, they are additional loans available to students who qualify. This is not need-based. So financially, you don't qualify for any of the other need-based will qualify for federal unsubsidized loan as long as your institution is participating in the student uh, loan program. Um, and interest starts occurring after the first disbursement. So the students are responsible for the interest on this loan from the time the money is dispersed to them. Um, both loans are funds that will have to be repaid. There is um, a grace period so the student can start paying on the loans while they're enrolled in school if they would like. They can of a payment plan with the Department of Education, or they have a usually 90 days, three month grace period from either the time they um, unenroll in school, enroll less than half time, or graduate to start paying back on these student loans. This just kind of breaks it down. Grants are free money, loans are borrowed money, and work study are earned. So how is the financial aid award determined? There are two figures used in determining um, a financial aid award. First is the cost of attendance, and this is an estimated total of educational expenses for a specific enrollment period. It's usually done, some institutions do it for fall, spring, and summer. It's usually done for fall and spring normally. Um, this includes the average cost of tuition, fees, books and supplies, room and board, transportation, and miscellaneous expenses at an individual school. And this uh, figure will vary from institution to institution. It's not going to be the same across, maybe depending on the fees, the location, and um, several other different things. Um, the average cost of attendance for the Alabama Community College System currently, right now, is approximately $13,750 that would be for a fall and spring semester. That would not include a summer semester. Um, expected family contribution is the second figure used to determine the student's financial aid award. And that is calculated from the information provided on the FAFSA, such as income, assets, and family size. Um, it's comprised of two components, the parent contribution and student contribution if they are a dependent student and have to include their parents' tax information on the FAFSA. If um, 
number that is used to calculate the student, uh, student financial aid package. And you do that by taking the difference between the cost of attendance and expected camera contribution, or ESP, and that gives you the financial need. So that's the final number that colleges use when creating an award package for students, is the financial need. These right here are just two uh, sample award letters that students may get from the colleges, just to kind of show us that once they have taken their FAFSA, completed their verification, and their award package is ready to be done, these are the these are two just samples of what a student can get. So the Alabama Community College System students and funding sources, and this is for the 14-15 award year, and um, total enrollment was. 81,912 students. Out of the, those students, 53,727 students received financial aid. And that is 66% of our student population. Um, for Pell Grants, 90,544 Pell Grant awards were given. And let me kind of explain what an award is. Award is every time a Pell Grant is paid on a student so if a student gets Pell Grant fall and spring semester, this is that they have two awards counted in this. They get it fall, spring, and summer, there are three awards counted for that one student in this figure. Um, and the total pay for Pell Grant in 2014-2015 is $181,703,594. Stafford loans. This year includes both sub and unsub loans. Um, and there were 25,367 Stafford awards given. And total pay was $56,818,735. And for work studies, there were 2,154 work study awards for a total of 2,344,479. Um, lastly, I will discuss two pilot programs some of our colleges have been <coughs> selected to participate in. The first will be Pell Grants for dual enrollment students, and then the second is Second Chance Pell. The Pell Grant for dual enrollment students is an experimental program for the 16-17 award year, and it allows high school students to have the opportunity to receive federal Pell Grants um, to take college classes dual enrollment. Um, the Department of Education will invest up to $20 million in the 2016-2017 school year, benefiting up to 10,000 students from low-income backgrounds. Um, 44 post-secondary institutions across 23 states were invited to participate, and Wallace Hansel was our college that was selected to participate in this program. Second Chance Pell is a five-year pilot program set to begin as early as July 1 of 2016. Um, and it's between partnerships, it's within partnerships between post-secondary and correctional institutions. Um, this will allow incarcerated individuals to access Pell Grants for correctional uh, education. Um, 67 colleges and universities were selected, um, and they will partner with 141 federal and state correctional institutions enrolled in roughly 12,000 incarcerated students and provide educational training for, for uh, incarcerated students and provide correctional education. And our schools selected were Cowan Community College and Ingram State Technical College to participate in this. And on the, the very last page of your, I don't have it up here, but the very last page in your packet, this was provided to us by Calhoun and Ingram's president. And it just gives you a little bit more of an overview, timeline, benefits, and the programs that they're offering to the incarcerated students at their facility. And I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have.
high school, and, uh, it obviously depends so heavily on, on, on folks in our financial aid offices. And, uh, it's still a, an overwhelming process, and depending on what programs they plug into, can have a significant impact on their, their financial status. So. Hey, about that conference and, and uh, the kinds of things they discussed and the resolutions they came to. Thank you, Chancellor. It's always a wonderful opportunity to get in front of the state board and, yes. and the board of trustees to talk to you all about what's going on with adult education. Yesterday at the state board of education meeting, they, they voted on something that is really a partnership between us and K-12 that we're working on uh, that's going to be an options program to assist people to actually get a high school diploma if they don't want to go on the track of the GED. So that's big, and I'm going to touch upon that a little later. So I, I just want to re recognize Mary Scott and her effort to get that through uh, the state board yesterday. So thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Rothemer passed out a PowerPoint presentation that I will also send you electronically and you also have a copy of the program luncheon program that really highlights the, the uh, students and the teachers that were recognized at the awards luncheon which I think is just phenomenal that we do that and it's a combination between our office here and then also our professional organization uh, and uh, it's a, a way to really honor those students and they each get a $400 scholarship to help them transition into one of our community colleges. So, and then we also honor uh, teachers and we also honor those uh, champions that we have out there throughout the state that really day in and day out help volunteer and support adult education. So we have a contributor of the year at a local level and then at a state level as well. So what I'm gonna kind of share with you this morning Our partners from the Career Center were there as well, and then our Workforce Solutions people were there, our deans, and many of our presidents were there as well, and then staff here at the central office. So we just had uh, great support, and then we had presenters at a national level and state uh, level as well. The theme of the conference this year, to really make sure people understand the role that the adult education plays in workforce development, was real skills for the real world and building out of that. And, and adult ed plays a part of that. And you know, my world of adult ed is a little different than the traditional world of adult education. It's people who did not complete high school, or if they did complete high school, they may be basic academic skill deficient. 
and it impacts their ability to be successful at a post-secondary level or to be successful in employment. So that's the passion I have for that population, and that's what we focus on. So real skills for the real world with our thing this year. Our session tracks were basically in four areas. We specifically designed this to really make sure that our programs understood how to do integrated education and training and do things simultaneously to help our adults get through the educational pipeline. These are adults we're dealing with. They have families. They are working in many cases. We can't go a sequential route. We've got to do things that does simultaneous integration of skills and learning to get them through the educational pipeline uh, quicker at a faster pace. So we designed these four areas, contextualized pathways, workforce solution, instructional technology, and then also innovative, creative instruction. And I'm gonna detail these out for you a little more. So uh, basically on the contextualized pathways, we talked about bridge programs. How can we help our adults go into community college, go into training, go into employment. So bridge that gap. How do we also blend adult education and technical programs, for example, where we're doing it simultaneously because the skills to help you get a GED are also the skills that will help you be successful in post-secondary or in employment. So how do we blend that? And financial aid is going to help us do that. Isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So Tanner and I have had a lot of discussions on that. Uh, workforce solutions is the other area we focused on. So we talked a lot about the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. You've heard me address that before. We also had representatives from the career centers, which uh, business and industry is part of that. We had several panel discussions with really the movers and shakers when it comes to workforce development in our state and on those panels. Ava Steele, George Clark, we had all of those folks uh, part of those panels. We talked a lot about soft skills, employability skills, those essential skills to help someone be successful at a post-secondary level or employment, and then building partnerships. And I'm gonna talk about this a little more later, but building partnerships and how we build those relationships that's critical for us to be successful. We also uh, looked at instructional technology. Uh, we really want our programs to make data-driven decisions, and I heard a lot of that mentioned this morning. We've got to do that as we continue to move forward in our state. We have to make data-driven decisions, and how to use that data to make those decisions. We had several sessions that were uh, developed around that. We also looked at technology, integrating technology, and, and more than just a computer lab, but I'm talking about actually using tablets and using smartphones and things like that in your instruction. And I'm also uh, later on just briefly going to talk a little bit about something we're doing in correction that's very innovative. We're doing a, a tablet initiative and we're doing it at Ingram State. So that's something that I'll talk briefly about in a few minutes. Uh, innovative instruction, obviously math, reading language arts, very critical. Corrections is the, uh, and institutionalized populations, we focus on that. Generational poverty. We don't talk a lot about that, but that really impacts our adults in many cases and how they approach education, approach learning, and approach the world. So we had sessions that really was developed around generational poverty and how to work with someone who is in a classification of a generation after generation after generation of poverty. Okay, ESL and then GD preparation of I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'm gonna go a little quick here on this. <laughs> All right, uh, I've broken out our slides, a picture tells a thousand words. So I have several pictures I'm gonna show you. I hope I, we've got the music to go along with it. I hope, maybe not. If not, I'll tap dance or sing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. You can hum. I can hum, how's that? <laughs> So uh, I broke it out into the welcome and keynote speakers. So I grouped all of them together. So you'll see the chancellor and I, you'll see some of the national presenters that we brought in and then people within our state to present at the general sessions. Then you'll also, we'll go into the specific sessions and you'll see some of the sessions that we had and some of the presenters in those sessions. And then we'll also break out the luncheon and the award uh, piece of it as well. And then we also have exhibitors. Uh, we have people all across the nation to come in and showcase uh, the, the latest and greatest in technology and in curriculum 
So our instructors could talk directly to the publisher. So we had that with there as well.
And uh, obviously, academic <coughs> skills and abilities for success. We want to make sure that they transition into post secondary or transition into employment or what's better than employment, a career. We've got to make sure that we're getting our students and our adults ready for that career. So that's what we're going to be focusing on in the future. Obviously, it's going to be done through integrated education and training, and we're going to do career pathways. We also are looking at all the partners out there, and, and I'm just naming a few here, but the Department of Education K-12 has been a big partner. Dr. Cleveland and I have been working together on several projects. One that we've got going that I mentioned to you earlier is a non-traditional high school diploma option or non-traditional option. We'll be getting more information out to everyone on that. But it got board approval yesterday, so that means that we've got the green light that we can continue to go on that. So thank you very much for that. We're very excited about that. That could be a game changer for us because students, instead of maybe getting a GED, can actually build credits and get an actual high school diploma. We also have students in our state that have a high school uh, certificate. Not a diploma, but a certificate because they could not pass at that time the exit exam. So we built something that will help them come through adult ed. We'll be able to do some things with them to show that now they can be awarded a high school diploma. Okay, so we're really excited about that. We also are working with DHR, Department of Human Resources. I met with them last week. I uh, also talked to, not only to the commissioner and the director here in our state, but I talked to someone at a national level. We had a conference call. Uh, they're willing to put about $2 million into our state, into adult ed, to help with people who are on SNAP. That's basically food stamps, to help them transition off. They're also willing to do a state federal match, so if we're able to come to the table with some state dollars that hasn't already been matched, we'll be able to draw down more federal dollars. This is a game changer for us. We're going to be working with those individuals who receive food stamps to get the basic academic skills, a GED, high school equivalency, and then go into uh, one of our training programs so that they, they can have the skills to be employed. Very exciting here, and, and uh, we'll be working very close with technical education on that one. Uh, Department of Corrections is another one that I'm really excited about. We're continuing those partnerships and relationships. And I shared with you earlier about the Educational Tablet Initiative. This is an initiative that there's only a few states that I'm aware of that's even attempted anything like this. And this is basically tablets that inmates will get and will be loaded with educational material that they'll be able to take back to their cells so the learning will not stop. It will continue. And we may do another presentation, Dr. Dessinger and I, uh, specifically on that at a later date, but that's it in a nutshell. And the Department of Senior Services, okay, I didn't realize that, that they have a lot of money that can be used for training. I met with them yesterday. I'm meeting with the commissioner next week. We're going to be developing a relationship where they're going to be sending people to our adult ed programs 20 hours a week and pay for them to attend our classes to get a high school equivalency of GD if they need it or to go into a training program, okay? So we're very excited about that. Uh, Senior Services uh, works with people 55 and older who needs to be retrained to get back in the workforce or they have been dislocated that needs the skills to continue to keep their job or to get a better job. And they also work with people who have mental and physical disabilities at any age. And I didn't realize that, but at any age, they can work with someone who has physical and mental disabilities, and that's senior services. So that was another hidden uh, uh, gem in our state that I didn't realize until we actually started uh, working with our partners through the career centers. And actually, the gentleman that we met with yesterday was on the panel discussion at the conference. So that got us talking about how we can work together. So just wanted to kind of, uh, show you that, I thought, uh, thought that was something that we always need to be aware of, and I'm going to leave you with one last slide. This is what I call the leaky pipeline, if you will. Uh, it's the uh, P20 pipeline, so from pre-K all the way up through college. This is how we get people into the workforce, okay? So this is the pipeline. Now, unfortunately, sometimes we have leaks 
around the uh, 9th, 10th, 11th <coughs> grade, okay? They end up dropping out. That's where adult education plays a vital role in this. We try to get them back into the pipeline so we can get them back into the college, back into the training, uh, technical education program. So it's critical that we do this. So even the ones that don't drop out, sometimes mentally they have dropped out about the 9th or 10th grade and their skills don't get any better. So we still have a large population of people that may have a high school diploma but are basic skill deficient. We can help in that as well. And it's all about getting people ready for the work. Thank you very much and have a great week. Thank you.